Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Historian's Lounge. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, the Wandering Quill and Wandering Scribe. Joining me is another guest from my Wandering Scribe podcast, Season 2. She is a military historian. She has now published several articles and several scholarly works recently, which I'm excited to share more in depth later. Joining us now for the first time on the podcast, my good friend, Lynn Marks. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So before we begin today's discussion, Lynn, would you like to um, introduce yourself and let everyone know what you're working on? Um, my name is Lynn, Lynn Marks, as he just said. I right now am um, been working on uh, doing research on Guadalcanal, the Battle of Guadalcanal, just to uh, have a different framework for a different amphibious operation type. And I've also been working on um, looking into military war dog history for the Marine Corps during World War II. So Nice. And in case you may not have known, um, listeners, for this episode of the Historian's Lounge, me and Lynn will be discussing the history of the United States Marine Corps, which is a very special topic, especially to me uh, being the son of a Marine. This is really exciting. And honestly, let's just dive into the topic. So many people, when we think of the Marines, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously World War II. That's truly where the Marines made their history in military history. But what maybe you may not know is that the Marines actually started with the foundation of this great nation of ours. They began right. during the American Revolution. And for a long time, no one really knew that uh, history. No one really knew that. So, um, Lynn, I'll go off to you. Um, what can you tell us about the history of the Marines beginning with the American Revolution? Well, it's it's great that you mentioned that. Um, the Marine Corps at that point was... Uh, combined with the army, so to speak. It wasn't really an official army for the United States at that point. Mm -hmm. And so they actually served with General Washington at the Battle of Trenton and Princeton and uh, helped out in that area. Um, their roles weren't like, you know, like you said, they weren't as well known for their roles in that such session of history just because it was very, they were part of the battles. They were just one of the guys happened to be in there that helped, helped win the, those battles type of thing. So it's not really a lot. But like you said, um, also as a daughter of, of a corpsman who served with the Marines, I, it's really important to understand that our Marine Corps history goes all the way back to the beginning of the United States. And so, yeah. Definitely. And especially the uniforms of the Marines, too, have greatly changed as well. Like yes. with every branch of the military in the United States, the Marines, I think, are really interesting. Um, their design was very much like the Continental Army, but if I'm not mistaken... Right the color of the Marines was actually a green color, which is very right. interesting, which is a contrast to the Army, which was, of course, the red and the blue uh, highlights, which is very, very fascinating. And that kind of leads into the discussion, you know, if the Marines were founded during the time of the American Revolution, why do we not have any mentioning of their importance um, in, the, in the American Revolution? And I think, just from my own research, I think the Marines were kind of clumped in with the Navy at this time. Yes, so they were. when we um, think of the Navy, it's the Marines as well. Right. And that, that would happen. The, the Marines would be lumped in with the Navy for all the way up to, uh, I would say, the, the Great War. Um, there was some time periods where there was fighting among the, like, should they be on the ship or should they not be on the ship as the ships changed? They were called sea soldiers originally. Mm -hmm. um, it, I'm not sure if I mentioned that in my paper on Major Pete Ellis or not, but they were originally, like you said, part of the Navy, and they were um, second-class citizens even within the Navy for a right. really long time. And they weren't respected as, as um, a unit or anything like that for a very long time type of thing. Yeah, it is really interesting. And especially after the American Revolution, one book that I actually read, which is really fascinating, which was, I believe it was Thomas Jefferson and the Barbary Pirates. 
Yes. And that's another history of the United States uh, Marine Corps, because for those who may not know or have heard the Marine Corps National Anthem, there's a line where it says, from the shores of Tripoli. Right. There's a reason that's in the Marine Corps National Anthem. For those who are completely unaware, the Marines were actually in the 18th, no, the 19th, early 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, early 1800s, they were actually the first American force to be sent to North Africa and establish an American flag in North Africa. And the history behind it is just fascinating. <clears throat> That's one part you're going to tell me more about because I, um, my focus has more been the 19th century from like World War One to to more now um i have had classes where i've had those topics but it wasn't like like you said kind of brushed under right the cover of other things just because um they were again they were second class citizens and as the navy as the navy um, ships became more powerful and less dependent on um, wind power and stuff like that that kind of went to some of the discussions were happening about what should the Navy still have Marines on the ships? Should they not have them on the ships? Just, you know, it was like one of those right. back and forth thing, whatever. And um, General Le John Lejeune, uh, he recognized that we needed, we needed to have their own role that was clearly defined in their, uh, for for the Marine Corps to be, you know, independent service type, type of thing. Right. They need to have their own role. And so this amphibious operational stuff that came out of the early 19th century and the interwar period and all that, which led up to World War II, the Marines becoming the name of, of the amphibious elite force in the Pacific, that all goes back to this time period where they're trying to figure out what they were doing and stuff like that. So you had Definitely. this war you had, which um, they, the Marines were part of also. Mm -hmm. They were in uh, the Philippines, in that, those areas and stuff, and again, a lot of the stuff that the Marines did during this time period between between Civil War and the uh, Civil War and Finnish American War to the Great War were these little wars that the president would send them to do here, there, everywhere. Right. So we had troops all over the place because we had Marines were be were the force that was sent everywhere, it's like you said, to, to Africa and all that. Yeah. And just going back to um, the story of Tripoli, because that story is really fascinating. Yeah, so <laughs> for those who may not know, around the early 18th century, America was engaged in a kind of like a forgotten war, which was known as the Barbary War. And that refers to the Barbary Pirates of North Africa. And that war was mainly fought because the Barbary Pirates of North Africa were taking American ships and American prisoners. Now, granted, at this time, the United States is still an infant nation. We're still trying to get our bearings on the world stage. And we're having um, pirates take our ships. And so Thomas Jefferson made a decision. He's going to send the Marines, a small group of them, to North Africa to get an army in North Africa from Egypt and fight the pirates. Now, Jefferson did not want to officially fully declare war on the Barbary Pirates because that would send the United States Navy further away from the U.S. And at this time, the U.S. was already starting to have a little bit of issues with Great Britain already. That would then lead up to the War of 1812. So Jefferson decided, I'm just going to send the Marines, and their job is to get a force in country when they land in North Africa and take out the pirates. And they did. They took out the pirates and they planted a flag in Tripoli. And if I'm not mistaken, that flag is still in Tripoli to this day. And it went down in history as the first ever major battle with the U.S. force in a foreign country. That is really cool. I'll have to look into that <laughs> some more. Yeah. There's so much. And no problem. With then, as you see, as you mentioned, Lynn, how the Marines were kind of like stationed like these inner wars later in period. And this one I did want to ask you. So going into the Great War, uh -huh. um, when would you probably say the Marines um, definitely established like their own kind of base camps? Because I, I, from like modern Marine history, is kind of like unknown to me. So like Camp Lejeune, Lejeune and right. Camp Pendleton. When did those start to become like the 
the hallmark of Marine Corps. World War II, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Um, yes. They had headquarters in, like, Marine, uh, Washington, D.C. There's the, they call them Marine barracks, what they call them. So they weren't necessarily base base, like you, what you think of as a base these days. Right. So they were places where they were at. Again, a lot of these places were at naval bases because they were part of the Navy. Um, even today, their designation is part of the, I mean, it's the Department of the United States Marines, but it's still underneath the Navy somewhat, you know, even though they're independent. So they kind of share. Right. And even that, happened, that um, it, it was like, the, I think the, I remember, it was really late in history when they finally got their own um, spot. And mm. the joint chief staff, staff even. So that's, I mean, it's really a, a long time. I think it was like the 60s. I could be wrong on that. Because I don't, but yeah. So it took them a long time to even get recognized as a completely independent force for them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really fascinating. And then still in like the, the modern period, definitely when we look at the Marines, another kind of history of the Marines that people really don't really know about is, of course, the Marine Corps mascot, which is, the bulldog. Yes. Now that actually has a really, really cool story. And I'm wondering, Lynn, if you have any comments on like the history of that uh, mascot for the Marines. Um, the stubby mascot, if I remember correctly, I don't have a whole lot. There was an, I couldn't find a whole lot on him when I was looking. So maybe you have found some. I haven't. Um, okay. He basically is reference to Chesty Polar, a Lewis Burrell Polar. He was a Marine's Marine. <laughs> He's um, uh, like all over the place um, in the Marine Corps. For his, like, He's a guy that all the Marines look up to because he led from the front. But he had like a bulldog personality. He's very in, the, in, in front of everybody, leading from the front. Um, uh, always took care of his men, very loyal. Even after he was out of the Marine Corps, Chesty was still a Marine. You know, he still had, he, st he wanted to be part of that world that was who he was so that's kind of where debbie comes from i think the bulldog nice refer to it as a bull bulldog nice and man just also add to like the idea of like the bulldog being the mascot if i'm not mistaken in world war one there was one particular battle that really kind of cemented the fighting nature of the marines right. and that was the battle of bella woods Bellawood. against yeah. the germans and yeah. the germans actually the ones that came up with the idea of the bulldog, or as in German, they called it Holland Hunden, which right, is Hellhound. Hound. And it's fascinating how that kind of established their fighting nature. I'm actually glad yeah. you brought up Chessie, too, because Chessie is a very fascinating character in Marine Corps history, right. especially when, if I'm not mistaken, he was actually brought in during World War II to create another group of Marines known as the Montfort Point Marines. And that's another history of the Marine Corps, which I had no knowledge about. And I'm wondering if you have heard uh, about the Montfort Point Marines. I've heard heard about them, but I don't have a lot. Um, from what I know, Chelsea Polar does not have anything to do with that. I haven't seen anything saying he has, so maybe it's something you have seen. I have a book all about him in my bookshelf <laughs> behind me. Um, because I was trying to rewrite a biblical Afri bibliographical essay on him that I already wrote, so I was looking into that just recently also. And so um, I'm really, the Montefiore Marines, yes, they were, there isn't, like you said, there isn't much about them, even in my Marine Corps history books that I have, because I have one, I have a couple of them. Um, Ellen R. Millet is the one who really wrote, is that one right here, uh, Semper Fidelis, which is a Ooh. really good, um, Marine, nice. Marine history book, um, and all, and it kind of gives you like, you know, a big broad overview along of the huge history that they have, like you said. So they're mentioned in my history books, but I don't, I haven't been able to find much on them yet. That's something that I'm wandering into. <laughs> nice. I've got there yet. Well, as a little brief overview uh, into who the Montfort Point Marines are. So Montfort Point Marines were established during um, World War II at the time when the, I forgot the exact executive order, but I think it was the executive order that banned um, discrimination in government jobs. 
48 then? Not, not 48. That banned discrimination in the military. But I think this one was with um, FDR where he said that um, this run the time with this Tuskegee Airmen, they were allowed to be in military um, service. I okay. forgot the exact, the exact executive order, so I could be wrong. But this executive order banned on discrimination in government jobs, which was um, employment in the military. And the Montfort Point Marines were an all-black uh, Marine Corps unit during World War II at Camp Lejeune. That was their base of operations. And I could be wrong, but I believe Chessie was in charge of drilling, um, getting these men into battle shape. And just sending them off into battle. Now, keep in mind, this is 1940, and we know like that. That sounds familiar. I don't. I don't know if this is called them the Montfort Port Marines, but I do know he did have the assignment of training Marines in preparing hmm. for war. He did have that, so okay. it's kind of like. <laughs> okay, but um, where was I? Oh yeah, so this is still 1940. So of course we know discrimination at this time in the United States was common, especially in the uh, military. However, the Montfort Point Marines did establish themselves as some of the most, like, according to reports, the most hardest working um, Marine unit in the Pacific Theater. And there's actually one famous unit that actually was partaking, if I'm not mistaken, was actually the Battle of Guadalcanal, which may be up in your research. I could be mistaken, yeah. but they were um, involved in the Battle of Guadalcanal. And one particular... Montfort Point Marine actually um, was almost, I believe he was awarded some honor distinction for getting his men out and fighting off the Japanese at this time. But I could be wrong. Do you know what number they are? When, uh, when they were in? Because Polar trained, trained several different things, but he was Guadalcanal, he's with the first Marines. Oh gosh, I have to. I'll have to send you it after. But it's a very, very fascinating. Actually, no, I have an article written, but I'll send it to you after which because it is a very, very fascinating story, and it kind of leads into like an, another big topic. Topic question that they want to ask you, Lynn, is that there are so many stories of the Marines, either it's like in their origins or even in modern history. Why do you think that even with all the research that we have, we don't talk about the full history of the Marines? I think they get overshadowed a lot. Um, the like you mentioned, the Battle of Bella Wood was like the when the Marines actually became known as that. Mm -hmm. Part of it, the Marines didn't have high standards like a lot of the services in the beginning. You know, they took whoever came and then they started separating themselves in that sense where they started saying they had to be educated, they had to have this, they had to have that. So those are things that made the Marines kind of stand out because they were like more you know more uniform and all that. But those didn't show up until, like you said. The Battle of Bella Wood, which um, we were, the Marines were with the um, Second American Expeditionary Force, and even right. that, you know, that if it, if you don't go looking for the Marines, you're not going to find them mentioned in the World War One, even though they were there. Right. And so I think that has a lot to do with it. They're just kind of, you know, the smallest unit, and so they kind of get overlooked a lot. I think, mm -hmm. and so a lot of that history is not even told. And like even even like. like you know, the, there were um, people in the Pacific, I mean, like in Europe, in the World War II, there were Marines, but you don't hear much about them because they were doing, you know, embassies or whatever versus, you know, so you don't hear the role of, like, um, Major Pete Ellis's amphibious operational theory, which was, happened in, in the world period, but which built on, the Marine Corps built on, and then it became the Navy, and then it became the Army, and so the Army actually used some of his ideas in World War II in the in Europe, like at Battle D Day, for wow. other operations, and you don't, I mean, you don't hear about that. You know, that's something. You know, Alice is one of those people that gets definitely gets overlooked, even though he has this incredible role in helping shape um, future military officers that fought in World War Two. Mm -hmm. Theory, you know, um, you know, all those things he he did, and we still have doc his documents to this day that you can go back and look at and read and stuff too. But right, you, you have to go looking for him where you're not going to find it. That that's unfortunate, and because, like you said, the Marines they do kind of get overshadowed. 
Mm-hmm. But the gadget kind of leads into like another like fun little discussion, which is I remember watching a documentary a long time ago. It was on the ancient Greeks, the Spartans, and one historian made a comment said, "Imagine if the Marines were their own country, that's Sparta." And I kind of played in my mind, it's like, "Wow, okay." So maybe Lynn, maybe you can talk about that and that in like now the modern Marines and like of course during World War II when they really established themselves were the Marines still kind of like the most in terms of like training and like in research like they are the most battle hard and battle driven that their right. training is different from the army um, entirely so. yes um even the corpsmen were different believe it or not up, up through at least vietnam um they are one of, were the most trained through me and it's i think it's it's changed but they were the most trained guys because they had to go through their naval training then they went through the marine training and then you know what it was expected for a corpsman in the field so they are definitely yeah i would say one of the most battle hardened because they're the first to fight even though it's not recognized as much today the first to fight the last to leave and so yeah they, you're right they get all this battle experience right from the start because they they are the president's arm so to speak they are our quick reactionary force that are sent anywhere and everywhere all over the world they are our trouble spot force that's actually interesting because when people think of like the president's arm or any leader's arm, of course they would think, of course, is the army. Uh, the right, army is like right. the main, the right. the main go to. But it's interesting how for us in the U.S., it's the Marines. The Marines right. are the most battle hardened, the most battle driven, right. and it's kind of interesting. A very very small group, but they are the most formidable, which I find just very fascinating. Right. Yeah. Totally. Um. If you ever get a chance, go to a Marine Corps reunion and get to see these guys in um, just their love of each other and their love of their history and how proud they are of who they who they are now and who they were. You know, they're still that Marine, even though they're not in the Marines anymore. And you can testify that with your own dad, I'm sure. You know, it's yes. just it's just that's who it is their their spirit of decor is so strong and i mean like in world war ii they actually had them building the camps believe it or not that they used for training so they were training and working and building these camps in these mosquito infested swampy areas like camp lejeune was Mm -hmm. Um, you know so they were building their stuff for the army they already have that stuff built a lot of times so it wasn't like they had to go do that so they're building their stuff and preparing for war at the same time and they actually went to um to colleges and, and stuff like that and recruited these guys that were um, interested in joining the Marine Corps that the Navy or the Army might not want to help fill the ranks. I mean, they they have gone over and beyond to try to get the best cream of the crop in the past. Definitely. And what I've always liked about the Marines especially, um, especially when it comes to like their very, like the officer's uniforms or their NCOs, uh-huh. Well, especially the officers' uniforms. I remember I was at the Marine Corps Museum in San Diego for the first time. And the there. thing that caught my eye was the saber, the Mameluke huh? saber. That is the most unique uh, saber for any branch of service. And the history behind that is so fascinating. And I was wondering if you know about the origins of that saber, too. I don't think I do. I, I went to the Marine Corps Museum in uh, um, Quantico. So I've been Ooh, there. Ooh, okay. And it was so cool because I I was like, I've, you know, I learned about this. You know, there it is. And then I'm talking to my poor husband about it all. So it was really cool. Um, but I don't, I'm sure, I mean, have you ever been to a Marine Corps birthday celebration? No, no, I have not. You need to do that. So at the celebration, they have this saber, like you said, that they actually use to cut the cake. So they have the new, youngest and the oldest. That's the tradition. One gets, for, gets the first piece of cake and cuts it for the other one or whatever. So anyhow, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of tradition in the Marine Corps birthday that um, commoners don't have a clue about. Right. And so it's pretty special. It's really unique. And I mean, they're all over the place. Like if your dad is part of any Marine Corps union, reunion activity or whatever, or association, he will end up having, it's probably celebrating Marine Corps birthday. And you could probably go go to it once if you ever want to. It's pretty cool. We, we have not been able to 
uh, go to a, any Marine Corps birthday. I mean, we have been a part of a lot of uh, veteran celebrations um, <laughs> in San Diego, and now I think well, not 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 yet in Orange yet, but uh, in San Diego we were a part of um, some uh, celebrations um, for Veterans Day. It is uh, very fascinating. Of course, learn more about um, his unit. He was uh, from the First Marine, uh, the Raiders. Yeah. That okay, was his so group. Oh, a Raider. Okay. That's pretty cool. It is. And we actually, um, he actually got from a friend of his who was a fellow Marine as well. Or I could be mistaken on the story, but he actually has a replica. Someone actually made him a replica of a World War II Marine Corps Raider uh, Bowie machete with oh, an wow. actual sheath. And it's so, so people, when I looked at that, I was like, whoa, the history behind that. And of course, when we think of the Marine Corps, there's one little utility knife that's ordered the Marines, K-bar. and that's the K-Bar. And <laughs> that is it. It's just so fascinating. Like, just those little things. If you see a K-Bar, you automatically think the Marines. And, yeah. that, and that's probably for, like, the most interesting thing. And it's like, even if you're not even part of, like, uh, the military or have, like, may, may not have, like, family members in the military or may not even have friends in the military, but just anyone says K-Bar, oh, Marines, it's so interesting. Why do you think just that is? Do you think it's because of like popularity and fiction that those have been made prevalent or documentaries or stuff like that? In like your research, just, what do you think? I think it's just part of the standard operating procedure for the Marine Corps to have a K bar. And that's just keeps, you know, it's it's been part of the Marines are. It's, you know, so it's, and it's continuing to be part of the Marines. So it's just like, a, you know, what are those Marine fixtures? There's certain things the Marine Corps does not change yes they do change their weaponry and as time you know they kind of have to and everything but the k-bar is universal it's something they can use anywhere you know in the jungles mm-hmm. or in the cities or whatever so it's very universal for them to use and i think that's that's you know it's just one of their things that they hang on to you know right it is really interesting because you know there's a lot of history uh, with a lot of mementos, um, you know, from helmets, pins, mm-hmm. um, medals, and stuff like that. And I was at the World War, I was at the Marine Corps Museum. Um, this is a long time ago. And there was one thing that really, really fascinated me, and I'm now more interested in it now, is actually the Korean War, especially the Marines yes. involved yes. in the Korean War. And that itself is completely unknown. And, like, no one talks about that. And it's, it's a shame that no one talks about the the involvement of just the Korean War because we, again, we were there. Again, we were lumped in, again, with the Army. So it's easy to, like, X-Corps. Um, X-Corps was commanded by General MacArthur's um, assistant, General, Net, General Edwin uh, Allman. It might be Edward. I keep making I keep his name just kind of those two mixed. Anyhow, he was in charge of the X Corps. The X Corps was made up of the First Marine Division and the, oh no, I lost the number. <laughs> 30, oh, I know it. Anyhow, it's going out of my brain. Anyhow, so they were with them. All right. And in the Battle of Chosen, we had this one group on the west side of, of the reservoir and another group on the eastern reservoir. And we have totally two different outcomes between the Marine Corps and the Army in those battles. Right. Which is, I, I, when I read about it, I was just like, why? What happened? Why was there so much more um, death and casualties and everything on the Army side than there is on the Marine Corps side? And a lot of that comes down to the, the experience the Marine Corps has versus what the Army did. The Army rewarded people from World War II had desk jobs as leadership positions in the Korean War. Don't ask me why. That's what they did. It really? makes no sense. Yes. Where the Marine Corps, you had to be at that level or one level below that to even be allowed to lead. So they, so that's a, that's a big difference right there. Mm. And then you have, you have, the, um, then you have the, the difference in generals and leaders. And for example, uh, General O.P. Smith, Jennifer General Oliver Prince Smith, he was so instrumental in keeping his Marines together and trying to make sure they were safe. I mean, he he actually went, tried to go above Amun to uh, 
stop what Almond wanted done because he wanted them to rush to the Yellow River through this chosen reservoir, even though there was Chinese reports of Chinese communist forces across the border. And he even saw them himself because they interviewed him right there with him. And so, but he kept his guys together. And he also had experience, again, experienced Marines leading like Chesty Polar, um, uh, Raymond Davis, and these guys that helped lead. And so a combination of those factors together made the Battle of Chosen a totally different outcome for the Marine Corps than it is the Army. And they helped the Army get out safely when they escaped and did the breakout when they finally decided to do it. But it was because of... So it's something that you don't hear about. Like, there's a whole book on um, Roy E. Ethelman. He's up here. Oh, he's in my other shelf up way above. (laughs) He um, wrote, like, the probably the first history on the Battle of Chosen, or with a lot of the, I mean, he went and researched um, talking to the guys who were there, the battles, and all this stuff. So he talked to Army guys, he talked to Marine guys, he pulled this all together, because there wasn't a lot of documentation available to um, look at the Battle of Chosen. And even before that, um, before I got to Chosen, we had the battle on the Ichan Landing, which right. the Marines were the ones who, again, they came in first. This was a landing that shouldn't have even happened. It was against all the amphibious operational rules. It was done in a, a record amount of time. Um, um, if the Marine Corps hadn't had, they, we, we were already downsized because of the World War II at that point. So they brought on all these guys, all these Marines from different spots. So they took guys from different bases. They brought in the reserves. They brought in all these groups just to fulfill the role that they needed to go to the Inchon Landing. So, I mean, wow. just, it's, yeah, it's incredible, all the things that went in. And O.P. Smith was one of the guys who helped plan it. And he found out about, I think they had like a, less like a month or something like that to make a plan for this. And they tried talking MacArthur out of going here. Like, there's there's other spots. They had mud flats they had to, cr- they had to go over. They had, they had to come, come up with ladders to climb up over the end of the land because it was like, um, there weren't no real true beaches then. Plus, they had a narrow entryway. So it was like all these factors that went involved in the Battle of Chosen, not Chosen, sorry, each on landing for them to do to help them get captured soul. So it was just a lot of different things. I mean, I could go on and on about that. <laughs> wow. But this is like, this is fascinating because, again, I had no knowledge. Well, I should say that I did have some understanding from like a previous guest a few years ago when I had them on about talking about, um, the Chosen Reservoir and the Marines, but just like, yeah, the Marines and their history gets kind of like shafted pretty much because we only know about them in like World War II and that's it. And then yeah. you, you just hear about, you know, the U.S. military as a whole in like the later wars in Korea and Vietnam. You don't really right. hear about the Marines, you know, as much. If you did, it was like combined, as I said, with the military. Or if you did hear about a group, it was mainly about um, the army. The, the right. army gets the most um, recognition, and not to like the discredit army. This is not like to like discredit like the army of any means. No, but in this discussion, it's pretty much just talking about how the marines kind of get overshadowed right. a do. lot by it's like it's it's two big siblings, the the yeah. army and the navy. And if you all talk about a young another younger sibling, the air force. The Air right, Force, Air Force is, is, had their own special treatment. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is very interesting about, you know, the treatment of the um, Marines. And I think for me, and I think for a lot of people who may have learned about the Marines, for us, I, I think you may have seen our Band of Brothers. That was probably the most iconic limited right. series on HBO. But another one which came out, which is kind of like the Marines oh, uh, really? calling card, which was the Pacific. And that documentary was fascinating, learning about the various Marines and probably the most famous Marine of World War II, John Baz Leon, and yeah. his story. It, it's so fascinating, which then, talking about the Pacific Theater and learning about that, I then want to ask you, Lynn, about, of course, your research in Guadalcanal and, like, the Marines' role in, like, the island hopping campaigns and how... That was kind of like a lot of pressure on them because it's it was just the Marines in the Pacific by themselves. Europe well, there were had... some army guys. There oh, were yeah. some army. But okay, the yes. army was 
because like Guadalcanal, they actually came in after the Marines and they right. helped clean stuff up and everything. Um, so we just go back to the island hopping campaign. Basically, what they did was Admiral Nimitz was in charge of the whole Pacific Ocean area. So he divided it up into cer certain categories. So MacArthur got the southwest, not southwest, southeast, sorry. He had the southeast. And so he was in charge of that. So those places would be where he would go. And he wanted Marines with him. He wanted Marines. And he actually had some Marines that, you know, were pulled back from him eventually. So he did have some Marines, but they didn't want them. Nimitz knew that the Marines were the, perf the perfect ones to do the island hopping campaign because they had been working on it. They've been practicing. They've been they had all these fleet exercise fleet exercises they had done, um, which goes back to uh, John Lejeune again as a commandant. He actually had a uh, flex exercise where he invited the army. He wanted to prove to them that amphibious operations are something that was doable. Right. And so. Um, they didn't have air. They didn't really. There was one area they still needed a lot of work on, whether that was crafts. <laughs> they needed to have some good landing crafts, which they did not have. But but he proved that it worked. So right. that was that was kind of a crucial crucial crux in the whole idea. Without that, probably we probably wouldn't have gone anywhere else with it. So he proved that it worked. Um, right. Now the real test test didn't happen until about Tarawa. Yes, uh, Guadalcanal is a famous operation, but you've got to separate them from um, Tarawa. Now I'll explain that in a minute why. Okay. Um, so Guadalcanal, they was like the big first campaign of the island of the Pacific War, because you had we had the Battle of Midway, which we um, won. We had the Battle of Coral Sea, which was like a tie, which gave us some you know proof that we could do it and kind of win. So we were building ourselves up that whole first year. After the Japanese attacked us, we had to rebuild ourselves. Right. Okay? So that's all going on. So then they go to Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal was a, comparatively speaking, I'm saying comparatively speaking, because of these other island hopping, other things down later on, easy operation as far as getting on the island was. They basically kind of just run up to the island, got on. There was very little um, opposition at that point. So it was kind of an unopposed landing, even though there was a lot of opposition down the line. So this was a battle that took months. Okay, okay. Guadalcanal went on for months. So we had all these people that were there. We had these, you know, these different marine units. We had the army units. They're all there fighting. The Japanese right. actually came in at night and reloaded the island back up of people because they couldn't get a, get through during the day. And another thing that happened at Guadalcanal that 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 was a learning lesson was um, they had trouble with unloading stuff stuff just kind of sat there and stuff so guys weren't getting what they needed sometimes like water or first aid stuff was all piled up here and the ships took off and left them alone believe it or not right isn't that crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they were actually on their own for a while too so guadalcanal they were on their own for a while so this battle lasted and i, I need to do a lot more research before i can go into great details on the battle of course but it lasted like i said months so then we're going to fast forward to tarawa Okay, Battle of Tarawa, which is actually a battle that happened on um, Macon, Tarawa, Island of Basho, Tarawa, and Apamama. Okay, the Marines had Basho, and they had Apamama. Macon was the army. Mm. So, they had, and it was the Macon um, raid took as long as the Battle of Tarawa did, which was 72 hours. They had little opposition compared to the, the Marines. It was a total different scenario on Macon than it was on Tarawa. Tarawa, like I'm going to call it Bay Shield for here on out, because that's actually what it was, the Bay Shield Atoll and the Tarawa Atoll. Okay. And so um, the Marines, when they landed here, they literally came in from a carrier. So they were under, um, I'm going to use a term that uh, another person, another historian named, Marine Corps historian has actually used um, storm landings. And I'm going to call okay. it storm because it has certain qualities. And one of the qualities is they are they were under the carrier, under a carrier heading. Okay. That's one reason. They went over a long distance. They were um, strongly opposed. Um, I'm trying to think all the terms. There was like several of them. Anyhow, so Tarawa, they had, that at that point, that island was so defended by the Japanese that 
it's like one of the worst spots as far as defense goes in, in the Pacific Theater. Entire floor. And they, they literally came in with these landing crafts and they got stuck on this atoll. They thought the water, based on water time, that they'd get over it. They, they needed just a little bit more water. And they could get oh, over it. I think I know where you're going with this. Yes. And then they couldn't. So they had to climb over the atoll and then climb all the way across the shore. Of course, as they're walking across these guys, their 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 friends are being killed left and right, you know. And mm-hmm. so literally, I'm literally have to walk over these dead bodies to just to get to shore. So this is, I mean, it was the it was horrific getting ashore for them. And then of course they had um, so all this uh, horrible defense, you know, defense they had to overcome and stuff. And so there are some people that say that the, the um, Japanese got lost their their head guy, he died, like the first mm-hmm. bombardment they had or whatever. And so that's reason why we were able to, to get through. There are people that say that. Um, I'm sure it helped. But we were like, uh, we got separated. We had, uh, think of it a bird, it's a bird. The beak, found its back, it's got legs and stuff. So you have three beaches. You have blue beach, right. green beach, red beach, and each beach. And so we had some, some people get separated through all this. Logically speaking, people got separated. And so we have uh, Mike Ryan. He's a guy that uh, got people together again. And mm-hmm. they, he's also started using um, a tank and flamethrowers, working with flamethrowers. Oh, flame so yeah. That concept of the flamethrower on a tank and a tank working with a group of, with a squad to go to these holes and get the Japanese out. That starts out with him. Interesting. Oh, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. So... I call Basio the classroom for the Japan, for the world for World War II. And I call that Pacific Theater because there were so much lessons they learned and they were so innovative as they had to be during this process. And we weren't even we sure weren't. after the first 24 hours, we weren't even sure. We barely had a foothold on these guys. And then of course we got a foothold and kind of inch by inch they yes. it and everything. And there's a lot more detail again, it would take me a long time. <laughs> Right. To go into it all. But because of that, and then they did a report after, and they literally sat down and looked at, okay, what could we do better? What lessons can we learn from this? What can we do to help other operations go smoother? And so out of this operation, we get the idea of underwater divers. Mm -hmm. We get um, demolition team ideas. All these things that we think of now as part of of, the SEALs and everything can all go back to the, that battle and it was kind of like the next operation was a little smoother as we went along you know because they got better at it right and some of it was like, like they were supposed to have um, bombing coming in and the bombing didn't come in was supposed to like daisy cutters and everything um it's just really but it's just so much in that like i could go i could spend more hours digging into that battle and learn more that's how much there's just tons of stuff in there. And actually, you, when you're talking about that, that instantly reminded me, this is when I was young, it actually reminded me of, for everyone who know, who doesn't know this, I'm a big fan of Call of Duty, the video games, and that one battle you were describing reminded me, for fans who remember the old games, Call of Duty World at War, which was the only game that allowed you to play in the Pacific Theater, mm-hmm. and everything that um, Lynn said, everybody, was in that game, the mission... Battle of Tarawa, exactly how Lynn described it, is exactly how you had to play. You had to go through inch by inch with the tanks. Right. Some of the tanks had the flamethrower. Sometimes you actually were equipped with the flamethrower. And that was probably the worst um, person to be because if you were shot in the back, you would explode. And that explosion is not going to just go up. No, you're going to expand okay. and get your teammates. So that was, you know, just incredible incredibly graphic at the time and right. everything is just like and it was the first time, word for word it was the first time that americans actually saw what war was like because they let them video some of that stuff and then of course the media blew everything up of course like the media does and people were shocked at the cost of war because war is costly right and it, it just is no matter how you look at it war is costly and I mean, there's like, you know, the times there's times to do it and there's times there's not. And, 
you know, this was definitely a time. Right. And actually, and kind of leaning on to that, I'm sure you may have, may have researched or may have come across it of the initial plans to invade Japan during World right. War II. Right. And of course, MacArthur wanted to use the Marines as well as the right. Army to, you know, invade. So right. in your of research and in your opinion, do you think if with, we did not get the bomb in time, that the invasion of Japan would have been the most costly amphibious invasion, yes. and in terms of casualties, the most loss of, of life since the Battle of D-Day? Yes, I would say so. Um, they had, the Japanese had their citizens so afraid of Americans um, that they were willing to jump into a ocean full of of sh tiger sharks that mm -hmm. would eat. and to be that that to, to have bought into that theory that those ideas so much that they were the superior race and all this stuff yes they would do that we one of the um things that is very noticeable in the pacific theater is there's very little japanese japanese um survivors that were captured they were usually the ones that we captured were either they were sick and wounded, and they couldn't do anything else but just give up. Once right. Once they killed themselves because it was expected, and it was um, reflected to their families. So this whole thing, and I know these people that would totally disagree with me, and I, I respect them for that. But I think every inch of Japan, if we would have had to go there, would have been, like you said, bit by bit. Uh, it'd been very brutal. It would have been very costly. It would have been horrific. Because those people would have probably hopped in and helped fight along because of that honor, that honor thing. So if you didn't fight, if your son didn't fight, you were black feathered, so to speak. Yes. You know, and can you imagine going them coming to the island like that? That's their mentality. It's going to be fought. And I do know that the Marines were respected by the military the people that fought them. I know, like um, in China, with the Korean War, they wanted to fight the, the Marines. Like, if we're going to prove ourselves, we need to fight against the Marines. <laughs> right. So they were respected, but it's just, it would have been, it would have been horrific. And I, if it wasn't for Hirohito, I think it would probably could have ended up being there still because he's the one who's stepped up and said, hey, guys, we're, we're going to stop this bombing happening anymore after what happened. Yeah, it is interesting. I've watched a lot of historical videos, alternate history videos, talking about, you know, what that war could have been. Mm -hmm. And they make arguments saying most likely the Russians in one scenario could have come down from Korea. They would have conquered all of the Korean Peninsula and come down from the south, well, the south of Korea into the north of Japan. So you would have had pretty much a division between the U.S. and its allies in southern Japan and communist Russia in the north. And another scenario is Japan is, you know, divided between the allies as Germany was. And it would have been a vastly different world, but right. it, it, it's a what if. We have no idea. And yes, the bombings, uh, I, I can't even forget the names, Fat Man and Little Boy, uh -huh. huge. They were shocking. They were like huge loss of lives, but it, it was the one thing that was necessary to end the war because I think you may agree with this, Lynn. Had the U.S. invaded Japan, I think public perception in the U.S. would have greatly shifted and would have called for the U.S. to leave because at that point we wouldn't have been fighting soldiers. We would be in fighting citizens. Santa. Yeah, you're right. You know, I don't – comes to Russia, I'm very distrusting because the, the only reason they joined in it was, you know, in the, joined us – at that point, I mean, the North Korea thing was like right on the cusp of like, we want this territory, we want to expand our territory. So it's not even, it's not even a case of let's support the, my allies. It's more like what's up, what's in it for me, you know, type of thing. And that's the whole reason that, I mean, you know, they, they basically helped invade South Korea because of, you know, that mentality mm. that they had. So just anything with Russia, I just kind of, you know, I'm suspicious just automatically right, right. because of their their past and our past with them really. I mean, we really do have a a long past with Russia. Um, the fact that after World War One ended, we actually had troops over in Russia uh, working with Churchill's troops, well, Great Britain's troops, you know, trying to study that area from the 
the communism spread, you know, type of thing. And the fact that Russia tried spreading communism even in the as early as the 20s, 30s, you know, other places before, you know, it ha before World War II even happened. So it was just crazy, you know, when you think about right. it. Right. And, and kind of going back to almost like with the Chosen Reservoir and the Korean War, and maybe Lynn, you had a comment on this. Do you think the Marines um, fighting against the Japanese and just the geographical area of the Pacific is so vastly different from the European theater that it kind of gave the Marines an edge in that kind of like tough environment? Not to say the Army didn't go through its own share of geographical toughness in Europe, of course, with um, the Battle of the Battle of the Bulge, but. With, as you said, the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir, it's two different scenarios with the Army and the Marines. Right. The Army losing the most and the Marines losing the less. So there has to right. be a reason why. Right. And that's exactly why I, I went back and looked at it. Because, I mean, I was in a, a cold case, kind of cold case, <laughs> cold war <laughs> history class. <laughs> Oh, it just it made me like, why? Why is there such a variation between the two sides, you know? And so I think, you know, the fact that the Marines are the, our land sea kind of force, you know, they do both makes it makes it a little easier sometimes, but it also makes it harder. I mean, they have a lot harder sometimes because they have to figure out where the least resistance is, um, the different terrains and everything. And but they did have help in that with um, Major Pete Ellis because he actually explained the specific was either coral tolls or volcanic tolls. He told them what what was on, what um, the people were like and what this was like. So they kind of had an idea of stuff before right. they went in. And I guess you could say the army probably had an idea what the Europeans were like because we were Europeans at one time. But it's just you know it's it's different because we did fight with you know the the New Zealanders and Australians and all. And there was a special relationship between them and us, it seems like, to this day. We still kind of seem to have that. So I think the, the I think fighting in the Pacific would be harder. And I, I'm not degrading what they went through in Europe, but I think it'd be harder because there's that long distance thing going on. And that's something um, I'm concerned about today in the geopolitical area in the Indo-Pacific is because we don't have the resources that we should have for a war in the Pacific at this point. And it takes a lot of resources a lot of time to sail those troops over there or even fly them over there. I can fly airplanes aren't cheap, you know, right. Gas and oil are necessary and we don't have it to the degree that we would need it for a war in the Pacific. And that's a really a great concern knowing mm -hmm. what we have in the past. Everything. Right. Definitely. And that is our like last question of the discussion. I think it's a really, really important one um, Lynn. So going back to the very, very first question about the, you know, the history of the Marines starting in the American Revolution. Uh -huh. And if I'm not mistaken, at that time when the American Revolution was done, there was talks of, you know, disbanding the Marine Corps and saying, or just integrate them into just the Navy. Do you think the United States as a whole will be vastly different if there were no Marines and they're just the Army, the Navy, and of course later the Air Force during the Great War? Yes, we would be. Um, we would definitely be different. And I, I, I can even just talk about earlier history. Um, the we, we can go back to the Korean War again. And okay. the reason I'm bringing them up again, because it's a great area to show differences. Um, the Marine Corps had a different idea about the Air War than the Air Force. A totally different idea. And their, their idea comes from the fact that the Marine Corps actually has every Marine is a um, is, is a rifleman, every Marine, including your pilots. So there's a special relationship between the Marines in the air and mm -hmm. the Marines on the ground, okay? And there's this trust. And so the Marines were really awesome at close air support. That was something that they sell that. And they still do. And they could probably, they could, within feet of you, drop a bomb. You know, let you let them know, you know, help you out with everything. Drop. So this is, I mean, that's something that the Marines were exceptionally good at. Air Force, they were better at interdiction in the air. They, they, they didn't want to do anything, do with close air, air support. And that's kind of why we have the Key West Agreement that happened. Right. Defining the, defining the you know, Army's role and the Air Force's role because they had this budding going on when they separated. 
so to speak, where the army thought, hey, you're supposed to support us. And then they weren't supporting us. So we'll have your own force. And the army the Air Force is like, no, we're, we're the force. And even in Korea, we, we had this fighting with the Marine Corps, even because they wanted to have the whole thing. And the Marine Corps were able to get it where they were allowed to still fight. So, yeah, I think it would totally different. It would have made difference in everything, I think, because the Marines are specialists. They do what they do. They do it well. And, you know, it would have changed the dynamics of um, the North America, South America, if we had Marines, because they were in they were places like Nicaragua. Um, Panama, you know, stuff like that, places like that too. Well, there you have it, folks. There you have it. And I think that's a perfect way to end this wonderful discussion of the United States Marine Corps and its history and its contributions to the United States. But before we end today's lounge, I want to thank our guest, uh, Lynn, for joining us. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today and providing your insight and knowledge onto this topic now where can people meet and engage with you and do you have anything coming out um soon any articles any journals right now i'm in the process of we're doing a bunch of different things so i don't have anything out yet i just got an article printed out um out though um it's major pls and amphibious operations and let me say, i'll say that again it's Major Pete Ellis in the Fibus Operational Theory on the U.S. Marines. And you can find that at Defense Horizon Journal. Um, also, you can find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm there. And you'll see I post things sometimes. Um, right now, I'm trying to write a little bit of a book review to post on there. So I'll have something up hopefully soon. <laughs> and uh, so that's where you can find me. All right. And I'll post all those links down below so you can uh, contact Lynn and just talk and engage. And that concludes this wonderful episode of the Historian's Lounge. Again, I want to thank my dear friend Lynn for joining us today and providing her insight into the Marine Corps. And it's just great chatting with my history friends. I really enjoyed these discussions. And make sure to like, subscribe, and comment down below what was your favorite part about the discussion and what other questions you have about the United States Marine Corps. Who knows? You may want to check up Lynn on LinkedIn and ask her those um, in person or via digital. But this concludes this episode. This is The Wandering Quill signing out. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.